Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Continetti, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and I'll be your moderator for today's Faculty and Research Town Hall. The winter quarter has just begun, and once again, we have brought together a group of panelists to provide updates on the continuing evolution of our operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer your questions. As we are all aware, the pandemic continues to provide new and unexpected challenges for us. These town halls play an essential role in keeping us united as a community. Some questions were submitted during registration. However, please feel free to use the Q&A window to submit additional questions for our panelists. Due to our time limitation, we will not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log the questions as they come in and post answers on the Return to Learn website with the link pasted into the chat. Today's webinar has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that is now pasted into the chat. Now, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our Chancellor, Pradeep Kozla, for some welcoming remarks. Chancellor Kozla. Thank you, uh, Bob Continenti. Really appreciate uh, this opportunity to say hi to our uh, town hall meeting. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. And let me just start by saying a happy new year. Uh, before we, before I say anything, uh, let me just first welcome our newest member of our cabinet, uh, Dr. Corinne Picasa, who is our vice chancellor for research, and she literally joined January one. So this is her first meeting. So. I'm afraid that we seem to have lost the uh, the chancellor. Uh, so uh, yeah, a little technical difficulty. Uh, I think we can come back to him, but I think we should then uh, just move on to uh, to the next uh, next step, and that is to uh, in introduce the co-host for today's uh, town hall, which are Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs Elizabeth Simmons. And uh, our vice chancellor, new vice chancellor of research, Corinne Peak Asa, as the chancellor just mentioned, as well as the chair of the San Diego Division of the Academic Senate, Tara Javidi, for their welcoming remarks. Uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Simmons. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Corey as our new vice chancellor for research. I really look forward to working with her over the future. It's always a pleasure to co-host um, these faculty and research town halls. There have been setbacks related to the Omicron variant. We had all hoped to be much more in person by this time in January. Nonetheless, we are resilient as we have been discovering these last months. And I'm very optimistic that we will continue to evolve to uphold our focus on students, on scholarship, on public engagement and on, on health. Well, one of the most important things we can do to sustain a sense of community when we are physically relatively isolated from one another as at the present is to do exactly what we're doing now. We can come together to examine data, to discuss issues, to learn about what's going on and make sure that everybody in the community is informed and everybody's questions can be answered. So thank you very much for being part of this gathering today. I appreciate not only your flexibility and the compassion that you've been showing toward your fellow Tritons, but also your engagement and giving of time as you are doing today by attending this town hall. So we'll be reviewing the latest developments in campus operations related to uh, students, the vaccine mandate, winter quarter instruction, research continuity, of course. There will be several presentations and then we will focus on your questions. Uh, please also remember that we do put out a constant series of uh, campus notices with links to information about instruction and research and other matters. And of course, the Return to Learn website always contains the latest updates. So again, thank you for being here. And uh, Bob, let me turn it back over to you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, ABC Simmons. I, I would like uh, to recognize uh, Vice Chancellor Research Corinne P. Kesa. Thank you, and um, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you for the warm welcomes. I, I in the last couple of weeks, have, have uh, just had continuous amazement at, at everything that's, that's going on. And uh, it's clearly a campus of creativity and innovation. 
Uh, and I think we'll see some of how that creativity and innovation has been applied to keeping our campus strong uh, during the last 18 months of very challenging times. So representing the research enterprise, uh, it is very clear that research ha has been impacted in a very severe and important way, um, but it's also been an avenue that has helped keep us engaged. And as I look into the future, some of the silver linings are that we have never seen more so uh, how important academic research is going to be in solving some of our really big challenges. Uh, so many that we've paid attention to with an emerging pandemic, um, but things with our environment, with our health, with our communities, uh, with our well being. Uh, so I um, am very excited about opportunities that we'll talk about in a little bit related to research, um, the importance of research again and engagement in uh, community contribution, but also in student experiences and, and providing students with the hands-on experience and the leadership opportunities uh, that we believe are such an integral part of your experience here in San Diego uh, and help make our campus stand apart. So thank you for these few minutes to welcome you. And I'm now very happy to turn uh, the mic over to Academic Senate Chair, Tara Javidi. Hello, everyone. Um, so um, my name is Tara Javidi, for those who might not know, and I represent the UCSB Division of the Academic Senate, which is the body that represents faculty, uh, uh, faculty in uh, exercising their shared governance. Um, I wanna um, reach out to uh, those who might have not uh, had the chance to keep updated uh, with the many initiatives and decisions that the Academic Senate has been uh, working on and, and dealing with. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, today thank the many, many faculty who serve on the many standing committees of the Academic Senate who really do the, the hard work that I get to uh, the joy of representing. And in fact, I am very honored to welcome the Chair of Committee on Research, Professor Gert Kaumberg, uh, who has agreed to be on the panel uh, and answer questions. Uh, if, uh, if there are. Um, when I agreed to serve as the Academic Senate Vice Chair and then its chair, I had no clue uh, what to expect. And, and I, as you can imagine, I was even more clueless when uh, the pandemic hit us. Um, and the past 20 months, uh, every single time that I thought I've got a hang of it and I have a sense of predictability, a new wave has hit us and with all the new challenges. Uh, the one predictable and sort of solid piece in all of that has been my, my uh, absolute awe and admiration for my colleagues and um, both your research, uh, but also uh, your commitment and energy that, that you have brought to the work at the Senate and beyond. Uh, faculty's expertise and dedication um, uh, has been really the most notable resource to pull through uh, the, the pandemic, I believe. Um, I want to here take a minute to just emphasize that, uh, as as EVC Simmons was uh, was talking about the Omicron and the latest, I just want to exercise that the Senate decisions about modality and and so on um, through all of that our um, our focus has been how to ensure education and research continuity and inclusive practices rather than modality alone. Uh, and I, in achieving this, I uh, personally am relying on faculty's willingness to reach out to us. So um, besides the usual channel of emails, etc., uh, et I'm happy to also announce that Vice Chair Nancy Postero and I are hosting a series of discussion forums uh, based on divisions that, that the faculty um, are um, sort of at in late January, early February, an email will come soon from me. Please uh, keep uh, the, the channels open and let us know how the Academic Senate can be informed and help uh, in the in representing faculty, especially as we move forward with research questions that is the topic of today. With that, back to you, Senior Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Senate Chair Javidi. Uh, we apologize for the disruption in the Chancellor's address, and we are trying to get the Chancellor reconnected. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna, gonna move forward in our resilient fashion that we've been doing over the last period of the pandemic. So in, the, in that uh, case, I would now like to introduce our first presenters, uh, Professor of Medicine, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, Dr. Natasha Martin, 
and Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing, Dr. Angela Socha, to give us an update on the continuing evolution of the pandemic. Dr. Schooley. Thanks very much, Dr. Cotnetti. I'm going to try to um, give you a sense of where things are going. As um, EVC Simmons mentioned, uh, and as all of you know, we've uh, had a new wave of, of coronavirus activity over the last uh, six weeks that we've had to adapt to. And I'll try to give you a sense, uh, as will Dr. Martin uh, in a couple of minutes, about uh, where we think things are going to be going over the course of the next uh, month or so. Uh, you have to be brain dead uh, not to realize that the U.S. and the, the European Union are in the midst of a major wave of this uh, Omicron variant that uh, uh, was first detected uh, in South Africa and Botswana only as recently as November 23rd, only designated as a new variant on the 27th. And then um, moving on around the rest of the world has taken off uh, mainly in the Northern Hemisphere uh, over the course of the last month. Next slide. One of the things that's very interesting though, is that uh, as we've watched it take off in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, it has clapped in the Southern Hemisphere. This shows you what's happened in uh, South Africa since its peak. Uh, in mid-December, uh, the number of new cases is down to about 30% of what they were. And the characteristics of this particular variant have been rapid uptake uh, and then a rapid decline uh, as it moves quickly through the population most vulnerable. Next slide. Uh, these are data from the UK uh, and the US showing uh, on an expanded time scale how the UK and the brighter red uh, picked up earlier than we did. Uh, and then over the course of the last week or 10 days, it begun to downturn. And you can see us about two weeks after that with perhaps some evidence of, of um, beginning to um, mirror that, um, that uh, uh, Kinetic, uh, we'll have to see over time whether or not this continues. We're a more complicated country with more different components, more rapid rise in the east, uh, later arrival in the west. So we may not have as a nation as rapid a downturn, but we are beginning to see uh, what looks like some amelioration in the cities in the east, like Boston and New York, where things uh, were active earliest. Next. Uh, one of the things about this virus, uh, this variant, has been that it hasn't been as clinically severe. Um, uh, looking at this with a at 35,000 feet, it seems to cause hospitalization about uh, half as often uh, as Omicron, uh, as uh, Delta did, in people who were matched for things like uh, uh, age and underlying risk factors and vaccination. Uh, what this has led to is um, uh, a, a, a lot of people who have disease uh, and are infected, but fewer people have severe enough disease to be hospitalized per infection. But because we have so many cases, the hospitals are getting a large number of admissions. We have more cases in the US than we've had at any time in the past. And because of the large case number, many, many more people are being admitted to the hospital, but many fewer are being admitted, relatively speaking, to the ICU. Next. That's reflected here at UC San Diego Health. You can see that we uh, have been running a census about, of about 100 over the course of the last 10 days or so. And you can see that uh, only about 10% of these are making it to the ICU. And those who get to the ICU, uh, many of them have had Delta uh, variants and very few of them have been fully vaccinated, kind of mirroring what we've seen in the past. People have said the vaccine, uh, this, the, the vaccines don't work against Omicron. That's quite an oversimplification. The vaccines are not as good in preventing infection uh, against Omicron as they are with Delta but they still do a very good job of preventing uh, disease. If you are vaccinated and boosted and get Omicron, your likelihood of being admitted to the hospital is 88% lower than if you have not been vaccinated. So despite what you hear about the vaccines, it's very important for us to keep up our vaccine uptake. Next. Uh, on campus, uh, we've been having uh, waves of infections. If you start on the right, looking at campus employees down on the bottom panel, you can see we were running about 120, 140 a day about 10 days ago. And then over the course of the last week, we've seen a gradual downturn to the, to the point that we're running 40 to 50 a day. The student cases uh, hit as high as 440, uh, 430 back about uh, a week ago. Uh, they've been trending down, but a lot of this has to do with how many students are arriving on campus uh, and the testing frequency. We're going to have a new bolus of students arriving uh, this weekend 
and we may have a significant number of new student infections as students repopulate the campus. Next. In San Diego County, uh, as I'll show you here and in another slide uh, in the, uh, in the um, left panel, you can see uh, a significant increase in the positivity rate and people going to be tested on the gray line from the county. It's hard to know how to interpret this because uh, the county testing lines are so long uh, that um, the uh, many people I think are just giving up and going home and only the people and, and many of the people who are standing in lines are one ones who are quite symptomatic. So it's hard to know how to put that into the context of other data. Having said that, when you look at the campus and employee percentage positivity rates, they seem to be beginning to, um, to uh, flatten out. And the case rates, again, you can see on the right, um, a uh, big peak in the campus uh, populations beginning to uh, uh, decline, but we'll have to see what happens when new people come in over the weekend. Uh, and next slide. Last slide for me, uh, you'll be seeing the daily case rates in San Diego County on the left upper panel, blue line. Uh, rates as high as 10 to 12,000 cases a day. Hard to know how to interpret them because they're somewhat limited by testing availability. Uh, the county has been backlogged a bit, uh, but uh, clearly, uh, we're awash uh, in uh, this variant as we speak. Let me turn this over now to Dr. Martin, who will give you a little bit of a better sense of where uh, things seem to be going. Thanks, Chip. So one of the tools that we've been using to monitor the situation is the wastewater monitoring program led by Rob Knight and Smithy Krethekan and their team. Um, we have, they are collecting wastewater from the buildings on campus as well as in the county. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so we continue to collect wastewater from over 340 buildings on campus on a daily basis. We provide that information on the public daily dashboard shown here um, where you can find your building and see if it was positive on a given day. Um, so that information, we encourage people to, to check the dashboard. You can see that at the moment, the vast majority of our campus samplers are positive, which is indicative of, you know, the high amounts of viral activity that we're seeing both in campus as well as the community. Um, just to note that at the moment, we have paused. Um, normally, we have a direct email system where if we see persistent and concerning signals, we send directed emails to individuals living or working in those buildings. Because we're diagnosing about 50 to 100 students uh, that are on campus, residential students a day, accounting for quite a lot of the red that you see on this um, figure, as well as the fact that we have a number of students, particularly graduates who can safely isolate in place um, that are known infections in those buildings. We have paused those directed email announcements. Um, this is similar to what happened last, last year at the same time when we had uh, uh, the students returning. Um, and just a reminder that you know the, the returning students participate in the, the return testing program. And so there's already good monitoring going on there. But we just encourage people um, for, for these days, while we have a lot of activity to continue to check the public dashboard. And if you haven't tested in the last week, and in, in particular, if you see a building that you're working or living in is positive, then go out and, and get a test. Next slide, please. Here's data from the Point Loma um, wastewater collection at the county. And these data are showing the viral load found in, in the wastewater over time for San Diego. It's been a very good and early marker of, of viral activity. And I think from the campus level, it's quite an, um, I'm sorry, uh, county level, it's quite an unbiased um, estimate of, of where we are uh, because it's not so biased by who's going out and willing to stand four hours in a line to get tested. Um, so you can see that there's been a dramatic increase in viral load in the wastewater throughout December and into January, our most recent data indicating potentially that there may have been a little plateau. I think we, we need more data, but hopefully we are reaching the other end of this curve, but certainly has been increasing in recent days to levels that we have not yet seen before. Next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of where we might be going in our hospital system? These are modeling estimates that my team has put together looking at potential um, hospitalizations in the coming weeks, as well as new diagnoses. And you can see we are trending upwards in terms of hospitalization, but uh, with uh, the, the rel uh, relative um, mild uh, form of Omicron and the high amounts of vaccination and boosting in the community, hopefully we will not exceed hospitalizations that we saw last, um, last year. But just to say that, you know, it has been a swift 
um, increase in the number of cases, and hopefully that will lead to a peak in the coming week and start turning around and, and we'll see in the next week whether that's true. Next slide, please. And we're using these county simulations to also update our campus modeling. On the left hand here, you can see we're uh, forecasting the number of student cases um, with the different returns of the student populations. You can see here that the returning bolus is shown in black. Um, of the, the additional students that are positive when they return. And on the right hand side, just showing you our, our estimates in terms of isolation housing need. So, you know, we, we part of the, um, the work we've been doing in the last couple of weeks is, is estimating the impact if we had had um, our uh, in person instruction starting just next week. We would have anticipated, as you can see in the, the middle part of the left hand slide, that we would be bringing quite a large number of students back right during the peak of the epidemic, leading to a, an even larger bolus than we anticipate of, of cases, as well as um, a, a serious uh, need for isolation housing. But being able to delay that return and spread out the return of the students across those Black um, return dates that you see on the left hand side allows us to uh, manage our isolation housing and personnel accordingly. So continue to refine these as we move forward and inform our campus operations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sosha, who will talk a bit more about the campus operations and boosting. Thanks and good morning. We've of course had to do a lot of adjustments to keep up with everything. So this will be a review of some of our booster mandate and testing requirements. So just to remind folks on booster eligibility. Uh, this has been a recent change. If you have Pfizer or Moderna and you completed your primary series, you're now eligible uh, to boost in five months after the initial series. In Epic, if you look at your medical record under your preventive maintenance, it won't show that you're due until six months, but you are able to schedule at five months. So uh, please take advantage of self-scheduling for boosters and continue to boost. If you had Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca, it's two months. For some of our international community who had some of the killed virus vaccines, they are not very effective. So they are eligible to boost now. And we're recommending that they consider a second messenger RNA dose uh, since they have so little uh, benefit from the first um, series they underwent. Immunocompromised individuals, please speak with your provider. These are often very unique situations. Five to 12 year olds are now able to receive boosting at the health system sites, but not the price center. So uh, for your children and friends that you know, five to 12 year olds can now be boosted or vac excuse me, vaccinated at health system sites. Uh, and then uh, recent COVID infections, uh, what do we do? We have uh, hundreds, actually thousands now of students and employees who in this surge have become infected. Uh, luckily they're doing well, but they're asking the question, what about our boosters? Uh, and we're recommending that if you are booster eligible, you actually delay boosting to 30 to 60 days after the current infection. This will allow your body, which is already getting in a moon bump from the infection to then get the best benefit of the boosting. Under the mandate, you have 90 days. And I'll speak more to that situation in the upcoming slides. Next slide. So um, what is the definition now of vaccinated? It's kind of changed. And so now we're using the term primary vaccine series, fully vaccinated. And fully vaccinated means um, you've been boosted because you were eligible and seven days have occurred. You don't get the benefit in the first few days. So we're saying give yourself seven days. By then you've got the benefit of the booster. Or if you're someone who had your initial primary series, you're not yet eligible, you're still considered fully vaccinated. When are you not fully vaccinated? It's, it's been fewer than seven days since that booster dose, or you've completed your initial series and you're eligible, but you haven't gotten your booster, or you've received an incomplete. In other words, you had a two dose series, but you only got one of the doses, or you've not received any vaccines at all. And under the mandate, that should mean that you have a permanent medical or religious uh, exemption that has been approved. Next slide. So in terms of the mandate, uh, the deadline for compliance is January 31st and boosting is considered full vaccination. So it is required under the mandate. So after becoming eligible, you have a time period to complete your, get your booster. For healthcare workers, that's 15 days. For campus employees and students, it's 30 days. If you had a recent COVID infection, 
And we know of your results. You were tested in the health system site. You've notified student health or COM. We have automatically extended your eligibility period under the mandate. You do not need to apply for a temporary medical uh, exemption period. It has been done for you. It's also important that if you had an outside diagnosis, let us know so we can actually extend your period of eligibility. So again, no need for a temporary uh, exemption if you have a documented COVID infection, we are aware of it. Okay, if you have an approved exemption already for religious or medical exemption that's permanent, then this covers the booster. You do not need to apply for an additional exemption, religious exemption. It has already been covered if you already have an approved exemption. Next slide. Okay, testing requirements. So if you're in that unvaccinated group, because you've never been vaccinated, you have an exemption, you're vaccinated and eligible but not been boosted, or you're boosted less than seven days ago, twice weekly testing is required. If you're boosted or vaccinated not eligible, then weekly is encouraged. Everyone regardless of vaccination should test immediately if they develop symptoms, except I'll have one caveat coming up in a minute. And as Natasha mentioned, if you haven't tested recently and there's wastewater in a building that you're working or living in, please take advantage of testing. However, if you've had COVID-19 in the past 90 days, you should not test again. There is no advantage and you are exempt from testing requirements. We know about it. We put you on a special list of all the people that we know have an infection and we take them away from testing requirements for 90 days. If you should get new symptoms, it is very rare to get a new COVID infection within the 90 days, but speak to a provider. And if they say test, then go ahead. The one exception is the use of rapid antigen tests for isolation management. That is the one time after you've gotten a positive diagnosis, we will encourage a test. And I'll speak to how to use those for isolation in the upcoming slide. Next slide. Okay, isolation, got some changes. CDC went to a, if after five days and no symptoms, fever gone, that you could uh, leave isolation spaces, but you need to mask for 10 days. California Department of Public Health has taken a, a stronger position, which there's some good science for it, because uh, some people seem to still be uh, infectious there, that they're recommending, again, no fever, symptoms are gone or resolving, and you need a negative rapid antigen test. We're using rapid antigen tests rather than PCRs because once an infection is well established, uh, by day five, the rapid antigen test works very, very well. The, uh, and that you still need to mask for 10 days. So another piece about the rapid antigen tests are in the early part of an infection, they are not as reliable as PCR. So that's why we're not recommending you go to rapid antigen tests as a surveillance test. Some of you may have read or seen that people are saying if your first test is negative, repeat it in a few days. That's because the rapid antigen test is less sensitive and doesn't pick up early infection. And it's not our recommended surveillance test at all. And you shouldn't get a false assurance that rapid antigen means you're not, you're fine. You could be in the early stage of an infection. Next slide. So uh, quarantine. Now quarantine, this is where you've been exposed. If you've been boosted and you're vaccinated but not eligible, so you're fully vaccinated, you test upon notification in day five after exposure. You are allowed to move around campus, but you need to be masked around all other, others at all times for 10 days. If you're unvaccinated, which could be you've never been vaccinated or you're booster eligible and not boosted, or you just got your booster less than seven days ago, you need to stay at home, you need to mask around others, and we recommend you test on day five, notification in day five. If the day five test is negative, and right now there is no clarification, it could be rapid antigen or PCR, and you have no symptoms, you can end the quarantine, but you still, again, need to be masked for 10 days, and you, in fact, could come to work masked. Next slide. So how have we tried to help uh, manage the situation with the students, many returning after break? First of all, we're encouraging the undergraduates who have been away from campus during break. We know many of our graduates actually have stayed on campus uh, to delay their return until later in the month. 
We're providing housing credits for those with delayed returns. And we're also having them do a self-administered rapid antigen test 24 to 48 hours before returning. We have a system in place where the students are requesting these. They're being FedEx to the place that they're at currently. They recommend that they test there, but upon, we're not relying solely on that rapid antigen test because I mentioned in the early periods, it could be not picking up the virus. So then we have all of the students complete a PCR test upon arrival, regardless of vaccination status, unless they happen to have had COVID in the last 90 days. Then we don't want them to retest because we already know their results. They should be only arriving if they've completed isolation. For off-campus students outside of San Diego County, we're also encouraging them to take advantage of these rapid antigen tests. We're FedExing to them as well so that they can adjust their return plans back into the San Diego community. And again, we're encouraging them to test upon arrival within San Diego in San Diego. If people are living in San Diego, our recommendation is do a PCR test. That is a better test. You have easy access to it. It is free. Uh, the drive up sites at the vending machines. Vending machines are working great. We did have a little supply chain disruption. So we had a kits that uh, were in the clamshells being handed out by the THAs in the residential areas, but we're back on track. If you've never had one of our te uh, tests out of the vending machine, um, we encourage you to have your first test at a health system drive up or the price center. You can try the vending machines, but every once in a while it doesn't quite work. So that's a safety valve. What is important about using the vending machine process, if you are using the vending machines on campus rather than health system, you need your campus ID, you need the app, and you need to pick up the barcode. It is critical that we see that the barcode is scanned effectively. That is how your sample is identified. We're seeing an uptick in samples that are unidentifiable. So the barcode probably wasn't captured. So please make sure you've got the barcode. If you don't have a result in 36 hours, please retest. Generally results are coming back quickly. Um, and you should uh, do not expect there's not consistently been text messages, my chart messages, when the results are being resulted. They're being resulted throughout the day and night. So just every 12 hours, I suggest you check your my chart. You may find a result has arrived already. If you don't see it again, go ahead and retest. For um, health care employees, they are using vending machines at the health system sites using their health ID. The uh, machines take one or the other. They don't take both. Sorry about that. That's a little technology glitch. So I'll try and answer more questions uh, in the uh, Q&A session as well as afterwards, and I'll be monitoring things as we go. Thank you. Thank you, Drs. Schooley, Martin, and uh, Sosha. I just comment, we're so fortunate as a community to have such detailed information on the state and management of the pandemic, and we really appreciate that. Next we are going to hear about the isolation housing process from Executive Director of Housing, Dining and Hospitality Services, Dr. Himlata Javeri. Dr. Javeri. Thank you, Dr. Continetti. Um, so as Dr. Sosha just shared, uh, we are encouraging undergraduate students to return in a staggered uh, manner. Uh, rapid tests are being offered in mail in advance of their arrival. And what is being asked is that if a student tests positive, they are refraining from travel until their isolation period has end ended, uh, which has also been affirmed by CDC. If a student uh, has done the rapid test and are good to arrive on campus, we're asking that they check in at any of the residential vending sites at their residential college. Uh, and there is a Triton Health Ambassador, or uh, known as DHA, uh, to check them in, uh, but also making sure they're completing the PCR testing um, on arrival. Uh, the check-in process is important because it is tied uh, to the housing credit, like Dr. Sosha talked about. So we know uh, when they're coming and they're testing um, as soon as they arrive on campus, which will allow us to isolate um, any asymptomatic positive students uh, very quickly. Um, as of today, we have 490 isolation rooms uh, contracted for with four local hotels. And again, just a reminder, these are rooms and not beds. So our bed count is greater than 500. Um, how, graduate housing um, has always remained open um, throughout the year without any operational changes. Uh, so um, no changes there. Our graduate students have access to isolation housing um, as well. 
uh, especially if they're sharing uh, their apartment uh, with uh, other students who may not be family members. Um, housing and dining, uh, so the dining piece of it is currently um, operating in a to-go model uh, for the safety of our staff and our students. Um, next slide, please. So just again, a few more details about isolation housing. Um, students who do live on campus, um, and if they receive a positive COVID test, uh, we are moving them to isolation housing, and they do have to be released by Student Health Services. Uh, students, again, who live alone or with family members, for example, graduate housing, they can isolate in place uh, while staying in connection with student health. Uh, students are not being charged uh, for isolation housing. Uh, when students check in um, at uh, one of the four hotels, uh, they are receiving the rapid antigen test as part of their welcome kit. So they have the kit ready to go um, on day five. Um, students can order their meals through housing or through any of the third party food delivery uh, vendors and they drop the food off outside the door so there is no contact with the student. After day five, if students have a negative rapid antigen test, again, like Dr. Sosha talked about, and no symptoms, then they would work with student health services to assess the release from isolation housing. Uh, of course, students have to agree that uh, while they're leaving isolation housing, uh, they will still remain masked when, uh, around others uh, through day 10. Uh, so with that, again, I will monitor questions and happy to answer those in Q&A. And back to you, Dr. Continetti. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Javeri. Next, we're going to hear about the recent winter instruction updates from Associate Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation, Carlos Jensen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Continetti. Um, this is just going to be a, a brief update, uh, reinforcing the messaging that went out last week. Uh, as uh, Senate Chair uh, um, shared, uh, there's a limited term exception granted for uh, distance education. Remote instruction is mandatory up until January 31st. Um, after that, instructors may choose to teach remotely or hybrid or go back to in-person for the duration of winter quarter. There is no formal approval required to do any of those uh, choices, but we ask that instructors notify and work with their department to uh, make sure that we know as much as possible what the, the mode of instruction is gonna be after the 30th. Um, we will update the uh, catalog and web reg uh, through January 21st, after that, um, we need to continue with spring and summer planning. Um, instructors, as always, uh, best practice, talk to your students, make sure that they're informed about what you're doing uh, and what the expectations are in terms of in-person, remote participation, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, those kinds of things. Good communication is quite often the easiest way to resolve any conflict uh, before it even starts. Um, for everyone's safety, it's really important that faculty think about um, accommodations for students who test positive, who become ill during the course of this term. That's different from a requirement to teach hybrid, but we don't want to create situations where students feel compelled to uh, skirt the rules or to show up even though they're exhibiting symptoms. So a great example of that is um, uh, high stress situations like a final exam. Uh, that's all or nothing. Uh, if you put a student in a situation where if they don't show up for the exam, there's no way to, to make up for it. Um, are they really going to be honest in all cases about whether they're they're feeling uh, well or not? The uh, call for spring modality change requests will be uh, distributed shortly. Uh, we are waiting for Senate to finalize the review process. As soon as that is done, that call will go out and we'll start planning uh, the the remote versus in person for for spring, we are expecting to be on the downslope or or hopefully back to to uh, a sustainable level. And uh, when we get to doing that, uh, DCC accommodation letters from the past year, so fall twenty one and, and onward, uh, will be honored. So if you have a letter from DCC before, you can submit that with your request. There's no need to go and get a new letter uh, from DCC. Uh, stating that you have a medical exemption, et cetera. Um, and with that, um, Bob, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Jensen. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Allison Satterlin, who will provide some updates on the student experience in the winter quarter. Vice Chancellor Satterlin. Thank you so much, Bob, and um, thanks to everybody for being here today. I certainly know um, how challenging and disappointing and a little bit scary this is for our students as um, we continue um, into this um, second um, year of the pandemic. And I'm so very proud of their resilience and partnership and appreciate the chance to share um, some of the remote student resources that we have made available through collaboration across campus. So I wanna share that we have campus Zoom spaces open um, um, in, in the Price Center um, and they're available for uh, reservation. Uh, we have outdoor study spaces um, available as well. Um, our, our library and biomedical library um, have more than 30 dedicated study rooms as well that can also be reserved um, in advance. And we have a, a, a dozens of open access computer labs also. Um, the information regarding reserving these spaces is available on the Student Affairs website. And I'll make sure that this information is available um, at the RTL site as well, if it's not currently. I wanted to highlight that our virtual student union hosted by the university centers serves as a one-stop shop for students uh, to connect uh, with one another um, by way of a number of student curated um, activities and programs that are both uh, virtual and outdoors. Our student retention and success team uh, has a number of remote um, Zoom available resources by way of the Chancellor's Associate Scholars Program, the OASIS one-on-one -on -one mentoring and CASP um, services and tutorial services are offered remotely, um, as are a number of academic support uh, workshops. Um, our success coaching program is offering virtual peer coaching and prof uh, professional uh, success coaching meetings as well, um, as is our Student Veterans Resource Center and our Transfer Student Services um, Hub also making sure that resources are available remotely uh, for students. And the Undergraduate Research Hub has individual appointments and drop-ins available remotely during this um, period of time, as well as information sessions, workshops, and presentations on how students uh, can continue to engage in um, research during this time. And of course, our um, undocumented student services um, program continues to make uh, consultations available by phone and by Zoom. Um, our Threes Company program is back in effect, which allows students to socialize in small groups um, outdoors while masked and physical distancing. Um, I also wanted to, to highlight that um, we have a number of services available through our student health and well-being uh, unit on campus that's affiliated uh, with UC San Diego. Of course, our, our counseling psychological services uh, remain available by way of telemedicine and the student health and well-being services uh, continue to be available and open for students uh, for optometry and um, other student health services. They are open and on site and ready to serve. Our deans of student affairs um, in the undergraduate colleges, um, our dean uh, in the school of medicine, as well as in the pharmacy and the graduate division have all worked uh, to make sure that there are ways for students to connect uh, around um, uh, co-curricular and academic needs during this time. Again, um, just navigating the pandemic together. Student organizations as well as recreation have also put together a number of virtual uh, opportunities uh, to stay healthy and stay in community. Um, so I encourage you to visit the Center for Student Involvement website as well as recreation's website. Uh, the playground uh, that recreation hosts um, is, has remote and in-person opportunities on the uh, track and field um, near college field outdoor areas for students to stay healthy and um, outdoors uh, with uh, a yoga instructor or um, uh, another uh, leader from recreation to guide you. So I also wanted to just highlight the Triton Tools and Tidbits podcast. Um, over the last couple of years, it's been highlighting campus resources and um, reminders to stay resilient and stay connected. Um, and then finally, I wanted to offer our technology lending um, program or our tech lending program that's a, a part of our basic needs hub. If you need a laptop um, or you have a student who might need a hotspot or a headset, we have those things available for students and can get them to them. So please continue to visit the Student Affairs website. Uh, we stay as flexible and nimble as we can in the service of our students during what I know is a challenging and difficult time. But our Tritons um, are great role models and I um, wanna turn this back over to Bob 
Thank you very much for the time today. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Satterland. Now I will turn it over to uh, one of our co-hosts, Vice Chancellor for Research, Corinne Peak asa to lead us through the research updates portion of the town hall. Vice Chancellor Peak asa Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Those with the other operations you've heard about, teams in the Office of Research Affairs and across campus have been working tirelessly to balance uh, maintenance of research continuity with the highest safety standards. And in that context, I want to start with some really good news, which is that we have remained incredibly productive uh, in research continuity uh, through, um, through this period, uh, while also showing you know, relatively lower rates of transmission in research facilities. Uh, I want to especially point out significant growth in proposal activity by female and URM PIs. And I particularly want to point that out because uh, press internationally, nationally, and locally have identified that many facets of uh, this uh, pandemic have affected um, in, in a very inequitable way. And yet we are seeing stellar performance across the board and particularly among people we know are, are heavy hit by uh, health and safety and family issues related to the pandemic. And we've also seen general, general not only maintaining uh, the status, but growth in, um, in awards. So I'm just very proud to be part of a campus that is um, so conscientious in how research moves forward. And with that, I'm happy to introduce our uh, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, Miroslav Kristich, who will talk about re research continuity. Miroslav? Thank you, v uh, VCP Kaysen. Uh, so our uh, first brief uh, update on uh, the uh, guidance uh, regarding uh, research on site. Uh, so uh, the uh, research ramp up plans, which have been in existence for over a year and a half, continue to be required. And please do send updates uh, to the usual address to which these, uh, uh, this information uh, would be sub submitted, which is the research ramp up at ucsd.edu. Uh, this information uh, being kept up to date is important for uh, various communications with people who uh, work on site. Uh, the, uh, the usual um, campus uh, uh, policies uh, regarding COVID safety uh, for research on, on site remain uh, in effect. Uh, it is important to stress that uh, while the instruction is being held uh, remotely, the students may work in research facilities, but uh, should not be required or pressured or um, coerced through uh, various expectations to work uh, on site if they're not comfortable uh, with that. So um, uh, the um, uh, PIs, the faculty are being asked to exercise flexibility uh, regarding that. And uh, I would like to commend the Graduate Student Association for being a strong advocate for uh, a considerate uh, treatment of uh, student researchers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, in order to maximize safety without uh, reducing the research uh, productivity, uh, we should uh, continue with uh, remote, uh, remote work whenever possible and use staggered uh, schedules for those who are on site. Um, uh, there are situations where in bench science, the, the proximity below six feet is unavoidable, but uh, please keep those periods of relatively close con con uh, contact to a minimum. Uh, please note how uh, uh, ill-fitting non-N95 masks are uh, relatively for, uh, poorly protective uh, of transmission. So do double mask um, if you don't have a KN95 or, or an actual N95 mask. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, um, uh, the stricter informant, uh, enforcement of the um, broadly advertised uh, 14 5 2 rule for the submission of, of proposals is going into effect effect and we cannot guarantee that proposals which are not routed by the deadline will will be submitted to the to the agency just as a reminder uh, the number 14 stands for uh, the number of days uh, um, for the uh, grant uh, administrator 
to create uh, a file in quality research uh, to initiate the proposal. Uh, five business days before the sponsor deadline, the PI should complete the research qu questionnaire and certification. And two business days uh, before submission, the PI must submit the final proposal, the final draft of the, or the completed uh, package through the uh, research administration, uh, administrator to uh, quality research. Finally, this last bullet is uh, very important uh, and it actually goes beyond what is uh, stated here in the text. So NIH has uh, introduced a revised biosketch, which is very important to, uh, to follow uh, related to uh, various rules uh, re um, regarding the conflict of interest, uh, conflict of uh, commitment uh, and, and, uh, and the abilities to uh, properly allocate funding. Uh, you see three uh, links uh, listed here. Um, it is uh, the one, the the one in the second line from the bottom uh, that I strongly recommend. It's an hour-long movie where uh, 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 staff from the uh, from from our uh, Office of Research Compliance and Integrity explains in detail. Uh, the nuances regarding uh, uh, those, those biosketches and interpretations about various things that may be ambiguous. I, I would like to, uh, for the end, uh, mention that uh, various rules uh, are going to be uh, instated soon across all of the um, uh, federal funding agencies. And uh, among the things that uh, these rules will require uh, is that um, both at the time of submission, as well as at the times of the annual reports and final reports, uh, things that uh, have not been required before will be required, such as the statement uh, regarding the travel paid by external entities uh, for research where there is time commitment, or in-kind contributions from external ent entities where there is a time commitment, and even and this is important because so many faculty, uh, um, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a part of the research practice of so many faculty, externally supported postdocs, students, and visiting scholars uh, with a time commitment should be, should be disclosed in these uh, reports. Thank you, and back over to you, VC Pikesa. Thank you very much, VC Krasic. And we're ending with another final piece of good news to pay attention to. Uh, uh, with some uh, funding opportunities, which will be uh, presented by our Executive Director of Government Research and Relations, Natalie Alpert. Natalie? Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'm Natalie Alpert, the Executive Director for Federal Government Relations at UC San Diego. And in this position, I work to advance the university's mission and values at the federal level. So that means advocating for increased investment in research and federal, and, um, and education, promoting UC San Diego's contributions to healthcare and innovation, um, and serving as a resource both to policymakers in Washington, but also to our faculty, students, and staff on campus. So if you have any questions, please please feel free to reach out to me because um, I'm, I'm here to, to help with those. Um, so it's an exciting time to be advocating for science in Washington as the Biden administration and Congress have proposed some major investments in federal research funding over the last year. Um, unfortunately, the political gridlock in DC is a real thing and has slowed down progress on both the annual appropriations for federal research agencies, as well as the president's Build Back Better plan, which includes billions of dollars in research investments. That said, you know, we remain optimistic that there is the political will to make a significant investment in science this year. So I just want to briefly mention two new federal proposals that faculty at UC San Diego should be well positioned to compete for um, should they get should they be funded. Um, one is ARPA-H and the other is the new NSF Technology Innovation and Partnership Directorate. So ARPA-H would be based on the DARPA high risk, high reward model with a goal of um, fostering faster development of treatments, diagnostics, and cures to improve health. Um, the idea is for ARPA-H to be, um, to fund use-driven research um, to solve practical problems as opposed to the traditional NIH-funded curiosity-driven research. 
So it's a slightly different model. Um, another opportunity on the horizon is the NSF TIP directorate, which is expected to enhance uh, I'm, which is expected to enhance use-inspired, um, challenge-driven translational research um, that addresses major scientific and technological goals while also ensuring broad societal benefits. Um, while we continue to advocate for um, with our with our representatives in Congress on these um, important initiatives, I also want to mention that there there is there are some existing opportunities that passed in the Investment and Jobs Act, which I'm sorry, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which passed in November, um, and those opportunities. Um, are around transportation research, energy infrastructure initiatives, and climate resilience. So, you know, please reach out to the federal government relations team if you're interested in learning more about these potential or existing opportunities. Um, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Executive Director Albert, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Now it is time to turn to the question and answer segment of this town hall. At this time, I would like to invite all of our panelists to. Uh, to uh, turn on their videos. During registration, attendees had an opportunity to submit questions for, for the panelists to answer. We have selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. If you have a question now, please use the Q&A window as people have been doing to submit additional questions during this session and our panelists will do their best to provide answers. However, due to time limitations, we may not be able to get to all of your questions but we will do our best to post answers in the FAQ at returntolearn.ucsd.edu. So moving on to the, uh, the first question, the first question is for EBC Simmons. And the question is, are there resources available to assist faculty severely impacted by the pandemic to regain research and scholarly success? Thanks very much for the question, Bob. My first and foremost advice to faculty and researchers in that situation is to talk to their department chair, their dean, or the leader of the ORU that they're affiliated with, because individual circumstances can vary so greatly um, from uh, discipline to discipline and so on. So for, first, first go there. Um, other things that people should be aware of are the um, the way that we have uh, in my office uh, repurposed the traditional faculty travel grants so that they can be used um, in slightly more flexible ways during the pandemic when travel itself is, is hard. Um, there are research grants that the Academic Senate traditionally makes available and one can find out about those on the Senate website. There is, I believe, a limited amount of bridge funding available through the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I know that that office has been able to help out in some you know, cases of some severe impact. Uh, the Office uh, for uh, Research Affairs, um, of course, has a lot of resources related to submitting research grants, including the new federal opportunities that were just mentioned. Um, in the presentation we saw a few minutes ago. Um, so those are all, uh, the th most of the things I've mentioned are towards uh, pursuing additional funding to restart. Um, I would also mention that um, in uh, preparing one's academic file, one should avail oneself of the opportunity to submit a COVID impact statement to make sure that everybody who reviews your file is aware of what happened in terms of uh, the impact of the pandemic on your scholarly program and how you're trying to restart it, because we do take that very seriously in, in reviewing files. Those are a few examples. I hope that might be helpful. Thank you, EBC Simmons. The next question is for Dean Anthony. What resources or supports are available to graduate students impacted by the pandemic to ensure their research and scholarly success without impacting time to degree? Thanks for the question. So I want to remind everybody that extensions of various timeline policies have been instituted in the past, and we're going to continue uh, offering those extensions and reviewing what else might be uh, possible in the future. We also continue to generously read any petitions that come to the graduate division from either departments or students so that we can aid anybody who needs uh, policy dispensations. 
Of course, uh, let me remind you that emergency funding has been generously distributed throughout this pandemic and remains available. Uh, we send out messages regularly to students about the availability of such emergency funds. Um, and then lastly, I wanna let everybody know that uh, a note will be going out soon from a bunch of us, just reminding us as faculty and PIs about uh, our obligations to support students during this pandemic and to not require them uh, to be in person during this remote period. So uh, really, I just wanna say it's all up to us as faculty, as PIs to support our students and to be as generous as possible uh, during this time of need. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Dean Anthony. The next question is for Senior Eight, Associate Vice Chancellor Kerstich. Have there been any updates to the COVID-19 pre-screening questions for in-person participants in research studies? So the short answer is no, but uh, it, uh, um, uh, it is best to uh, actually review what these questions are and, uh, and here's how to get to that. Uh, first go to Blink, uh, then go to the uh, research ramp up set within Blink and then select the uh, menu related to the human subjects research. And uh, uh, it explains all uh, the symptom screening requirements for people involved in uh, uh, in-person research. Thank you. Uh, we have another question for you, Senior ABC Kerstich. Will the university cover the cost of COVID testing on human research subjects to facilitate continuity of research? So uh, the short answer is no, uh, because uh, COVID testing for participants in uh, human subject research is not required, although it is highly recommended. Uh, the university is not able to cover the cost of uh, those tests, but some funding agencies uh, do allow the cost to be charged to grants. Thank you. Now I'd like to move to a question for Dr. Sosha. Would you be able to provide more information as to why those that test positive, staff, students, and faculty, do not need to retest within the first 90 days after a positive test? Without a follow-up negative test, how can we be sure that we're no longer contagious or uh, of concern to those around us? Sure, it's a good question. And I think one, uh, we have to realize that we have lived with this virus for quite a while. Yes, there are new variants. And so we've been able to see the patterns of infection and spread. And it looks very much consistent that after a 10 day period of isolation, if you're without symptoms, that you are not shedding enough virus to be infectious to other. But you may be setting just enough virus or uh, protein, viral particles or RNA that could be picked up, particularly on the PCR tests, which are highly sensitive. And so you would get a false sense. And this came out, a lot of studies with people in hospitals, I mean, the people did shed for a period of time beyond the isolation, but they weren't infectious. So we really don't want those extra tests that not only do they use up resources, they have the team that's caring for individuals who really have new infections derailed and focused and, and not able to provide for those individuals. So adding an unnecessary positive test into the system takes things away from others who have new infections. So feel very comfortable. If you've completed the isolation period, you're without symptoms, you're done, you're not infectious to others, to your other family members. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. Next question is for Vice Chancellor Matthews. Will the university provide KN95 level of masks to students and employees returning to work? Where and how can I get them? Well, thank you, Dr. Continetti. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we have certainly learned quite a bit. Uh, most clearly, we've learned that masking is imperative to limiting the transmission of the viruses and the variants. We are, at, well, throughout the pandemic, we have provided masks to students, faculty, staff, and we will continue to do that. And at this juncture, yes, the, the mask of choice in terms of what we're distributing is now the KN or the K95 mask. And, and Miroslav and others have mentioned how to wear those masks. Uh, we've got some information in the links, I believe, uh, that will give you better understanding of the personal protective equipment approach. Um, masks can be obtained through Trade Street, in, in part because they have good, a great distribution system and service. Uh, if it's an emergency situation through the EOC, 
They have limited supplies, however, and there are opportunities that have been provided throughout student affairs to have masks available in a number of locations that students frequent. So at this juncture, they're free for use on campus. Let me stress that. Uh, we, we do not have unlimited supplies, but we're not charging people for masks at this juncture. And yes, I did see a, a question in the chat. People can buy them at the bookstore. I'm not sure about Target. Uh, and you can also buy them online. Beware though, there are some counterfeits out there and you just have to be careful in terms of how you source those masks. But the campus masks that we have obtained are properly certified and they are free. Thank you. Thank you, BC A little Matt. bit to that. Um, I just wanna, people are wondering about how long you can wear those masks and use those masks because they are an important supply and we're lucky we have so many of them. We've thought a lot about this and the recommendation is you can have five days of use. They don't have to be sequential as long as they're not soiled or wet. If that happens, please discard them. But please don't put a mask on for 15 minutes, throw it in the, you know, away, and then pick up another one and go through five a day. That will take away from the supply and not necessary. So just reiterating, five days of use, not necessarily consecutive, unless soiled or wet, and then you do need a new mask. Sorry, I just thought that was important to add. It, it is, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, BC Matthews and Dr. Sosha. I mean, that's one thing we've certainly learned with the recognition that this is an airborne virus that we really need to up our game with respect to masks. It's the best tool for controlling it. Uh, now, the next question is for ABC Jensen. When we return to in-person instruction, will there be any changes to the COVID-19 laboratory safety and classroom guidelines? So our, our work on the classrooms and the labs um, continues. It's been we, we've continuously been working with our facility management colleagues and our health colleagues to, to create healthier environments. There are no major new updates planned. Um, if you are returning to in-person teaching in a, a lab setting especially, um, and you have concerns based on what you expect to do in that space, we ask that you work with your department uh, and uh, convey any any concerns or, or any uh, suggestions for improvements that you may have, and we'll be happy to take a look at what we can do to make uh, our workplace even safer. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next question, I believe, is to uh, Dr. Schooley, and the question is, will the university provide a second booster shot, and what will be the timing for such a program? Will we be eligible five months after our first booster? We're watching very carefully the longevity of uh, the immune response after the boosters. Uh, there are a number of studies going on that are NIH supported looking at this. Uh, and it's clear that um, coronavirus immunity doesn't last that long uh, from vaccines or from natural infection. And I think we're gonna need another booster shot. The real question is whether we're gonna need an Omicron specific one or one that's more uh, general. Uh, we'll know that, I think, in the next few months, but I think we're going to need more booster shots. And when they're necessary, I think the university is going to be there as it has to stand behind it and keep our workplace uh, and our uh, teaching uh, location safe. Thank you. And I'd like to follow up, Dr. Schooley, with another vaccine-related question. What is the current estimate for the timing of vaccine approval for children under five years old? The first round of uh, vac uh, vaccination um, uh, vaccine studies for under five-year-olds undershot in terms of the level of, of antigen that was provided in the, in the um, research studies. And they've kind of gone back to the drawing board and are trying to up the dose a little bit and thinking about a third injection. Uh, the FDA has been very careful about not approving vaccines until they know exactly the right dose in the past. And I think that slowed this down. My bet is it won't be until April or so, but uh, I, I had... If they'd gotten it right the first time, it would have been December, but uh, this is why it's called research. Um, uh, dose optimization is important. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schooley. The next question is for Vice Chancellor Satterlin. Are there any updated guidelines available regarding in-person public events that will occur after February the 1st? Thanks for this important question, Bob. We know events um, are a particularly important part of university life. At this point, we do not have any new guidelines. Uh, we remain optimistic that the uh, pre-surge pre -surge guidelines are the one that we will um, uh, deploy as we come into uh, February. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, then, uh, uh, Dr. Schooley, I'm going to come back to you for another question, if possible. Uh, and the question pertains to whether or not the campus health system has begun to see cases of simultaneous infection with the flu virus and with coronavirus, so-called fluorona, and uh, if this is a cause for concern. And if Dr. Schooley is not available, I don't know, Dr. Sosha, could you? Oh, right. there he is. Did you hear that question, Skip, uh, Chip? No. Okay. Dr. Sosha, can you uh, address that? Yeah, there are At least some. A year and a half. And um, oh. uh, reported right after the first wave of uh, coronavirus. But there's nothing really special about it. And uh, it doesn't happen often. Masking against both. So it's, it's something that uh, we see more in the newspapers than in the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schooley. Uh, the next question is for you, Dr. Sosha. Is UC San Diego Health scheduling booster appointments for 12 to 15 year olds? Yes, uh, UC San Diego Health is able to do boosters for the five to 12 year old group. Uh, it's not at the price center though. So you should be able to book um, an appointment at the other health system sites, including the drive ups. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to go back to you, Dr. Schooley. Uh, will antibodies from prior COVID-19 infection eventually negate the need for future boosters as the virus mutates and weakens? Is herd immunity possible for this virus? You know, we've had coronaviruses present in the human population for at least 800 years. There are a couple that come back and infect us every two or three years. And uh, when they come back, they cause about a third of the cases that seem like influenza to healthcare providers when you come in to see them, but test negative on influenza tests. And we generally buy a box of Kleenex and do all right. Um, will this virus head in that direction? Um, the Omicron variant is hopeful, but it's only one, it's the first variant that has looked more benign than the past one. So we'll have to watch carefully. Um, even with the circulating coronaviruses, the ones that are called endemic coronaviruses, older people get in trouble with them and end up in the hospital and some die. So I think it'll be a while before we get there. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we need to follow the morbidity in the population, uh, stay up on um, vaccination and try to um, head off these kinds of waves that we've been having to deal with every four or five months. Thank you, Dr. Schooley. The next question is for Dr. Sosha. Why can't staff or faculty use the vending machine kits for their first COVID test? They, they can most of the time, but every once in a while, we seem to have folks um, through the system and we can't quite explain it. We haven't figured it out. So we've said on the safe side, try the, the other, because then we know for sure there's an order in the EPIC system. Any future tests are gonna connect to you and be routed through the whole process. Um, we have tried to make it as a first step, but and it works most of the time, but not so consistently that if you can do it the other way, we're a little more assured that we'll, every subsequent test will be picked up and worked through the system seamlessly. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. Now, given the state of the pandemic, it's no surprise there are a lot of questions about vaccines and our response to the pandemic. So I'm coming back to you again, Dr. Sosha, and I know you covered this in your presentation, but can you review why is the campus well, is the campus following the five-day guidelines from the CDC for isolation and quarantine? And what will be the masking requirements associated with returning to campus after a positive diagnosis in days six through 10? So, um, so let's see, exposure and actual infection. Let's take it into two pieces. So you've got a diagnosis. When can you come back to campus? And for that, this is where California has something a little more than the CDC which is a requirement for a negative rapid antigen test to leave isolation. But they're both consistent that you stay masked for 10 days. CDC isn't asking for that antigen test. California is. We're in the California and we think that makes a lot of sense because some of the folks are still shedding a fair amount of virus, particularly those that are symptomatic day five, six, and seven. So if you have a positive rapid antigen test on day five or six, stay in isolation. Don't keep testing, waiting that you're gonna get another negative. You basically got it, finish the 10 days, stay where you are. So that's the isolation piece. Quarantine for the fully vaccinated individual, which means you're boosted when booster eligible, 
or fully vaccinated, not yet eligible, then the requirement under California does allow those individuals when they are fully masked for the 10 day period to work. You need to test when you're notified of an exposure and on day five. That's very uh, high likely if you have converted, we'll find out about it. If you are in the community that is more vulnerable to the infection, the unvaccinated, booster eligible and not boosted, then you need to actually stay at home for the five day period, quarantine, right? Not come to work. Again, test upon notification and day five. If the day five test is negative and you don't have symptoms, then you can actually come back to work completing the 10 days of masking. Well, thank you, Dr. Sosha, uh, so much. And uh, at this point, uh, I think we're going to conclude the uh, question answer period for today's town hall. I want to thank everyone for the questions. I, I noted there was a lot of uh, activity in the, in the Q&A window, and uh, we're going to be uh, addressing that in, uh, in the uh, Return to Learn website. So, so uh, I would like to thank the presenters and guests today for sharing their time and information. Uh, as I said before, we're really, really fortunate to have such detailed, up-to-date information on the state and response to the uh, pandemic that we're dealing with. And I thank you, the attendees, the faculty and researchers of UC San Diego, for, for coming today, joining us, and working together as a community to help bring us through these unprecedented times. We had more than 400 attendees today. And as I mentioned in the beginning, these town halls are an important part of how we stay united as a community. To help improve them, please uh, complete the post-event survey that you'll be sent shortly to help us continue to refine our communications methods during this challenging period. The next Return to Learn Town Hall for staff will be on Wednesday, January the 26th. Future faculty and research town halls are being planned, and you can visit the Return to Learn website to register, and the uh, link is uh, put into the uh, chat. So at this point, this concludes the Return to Learn Faculty and Research Town Hall. I want to thank you all again. I hope that you take care, you stay safe during this time, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all on campus in person again soon. Thank you.